It didn't fly at the barn or anything? No, another one flew at the barn. Oh, okay. But the same, of the same type. The Tyvek with uh -huh. Delta. There are very few materials involved. Can you hold the tip of this bar so I'm bending the bar and not putting all the pressure on it? This is the Public Lab's uh, infrared camera tool with two cameras, one modified for infrared and one unmodified. The Fisherman's Friend box has a little $5 timer kit, which is sending a signal to both cameras so they fire simultaneously. And as soon as the timer clicks the shutters a couple more times, I'll have some confidence that it's actually working. Yeah, well, the Delta Kite has just started flying, and it's it's gaining elevation. Any second now, we'll be able to get a picture with all four of them right above us. So, almost, almost. The most important thing about gressets mapping is not that we're using balloons and kites to take cheap aerial photographs. It's that aerial photographs are being taken without things like airplanes. There is a technology that we've developed together, but primarily there's people uh, who understand a context, they're motivated by certain you know, beliefs or, um, or needs, and that, that really gives you different data, and it gives that data to different people and different players, and it changes how it works. <laughs> I see nothing to make a pun about right now. There's a camera on you. And then Public Lab is what resulted when a group of the grassroots mapping community got together and decided to kind of expand, relaunch, and um, uh, scale the idea, the pattern of grassroots mapping, which is to do kind of low cost DIY, open source technology to other environmental problems. You know, there's a place just up the road called Golden Meadow, and I think you can see why they would name a place like this that. Although this place, Terrebonne, the good earth, has been turning into water. And what's, the place of Golden Meadow has been turned into a, a brown pond. This is the second barn raising that Public Lab has done. It's kind of a collective gathering to get together, put our minds together, get through tool develop, similar to how you know communities came together to raise structures. A lot of us know each other's names from being on a listserv or seeing each other posting research notes. Uh, so we have a really great online presence. Um, people talk quite a bit uh, over their computers, but we want to refocus as well um, and make sure that there is a focus on or New Orleans, or New York City, or wherever you might happen to be. Okay, that's north? That's north. Okay. Stand in line. Wait, wait, that's north. north. <laughs> so Liz, where we work or and where we live? Yeah. Work. Um, where you work? Where you work? Hello, I'm Stuart. I'm out here in California. <laughs> We're in Oakland, California. I can't hear you over there. <laughs> I am here. I like to teach kids about maps and about other things too. And I'm gonna re geolocate myself to New Orleans because I just moved here like a month ago from New York. But my headspace is still very much in New York. I first learned about grassroots mapping when I unofficially audited Liz Berry's undergrad class while in graduate school. So I did some mapping in Newark, New Jersey and then Gowanus Canal, and then I moved to D.C. for a hot second. I came back to Massachusetts. I'm very happy to be back here, and now I'm trying to engage with the Boston community. Two years ago, I saw Jeff give a talk, <laughs> and he showed how to do balloon photography. I actually ignored it for about three days until I got home from the conference, and it sunk in. It's really amazing how smart it was to reduce the barriers to entry to taking photographs in the air. When we go in with a kite and we take a color infrared photo, 
This plant is going to give a different color depending on time of year. In the summertime, this plant and the vast prairie of it would show very red in a color infrared photo. As the season changes, you get more yellow, so the color would turn pink and more pink until, you know, by January this would be brown and the signature would be gray or white. I feel like it's a two-part perspective. You're able to understand your built environment by walking around with the kite or the balloon and figuring out where you can stand or where you can't stand to gather the images. So you're, you're looking at everything around you from the ground, but then you also add a layer to it by creating your own aerial image that shows you where you just were. Typically, you're going to have hundreds of pictures. The first thing I do before I kind of open the map programs and, and start trying to actually make the map, I just look at the pictures. And I look at them chronologically. Uh, through the flight, and it kind of gives you a little familiarity with how the flight went. You can see, you know, where your highest pictures were, where the camera um, traveled. So, cameras almost, and almost. orthorectifying images and, and kites. These are things that have been around for a while. I have GIS software on my computer. It's not necessarily easy to use. It's not something anybody can pick up. The real thing that Plots has done is take all of this technology that's already in use and distill it down so it's accessible to a non-expert. That's a huge deal of work to do. I expected to go there and be a spectator, probably nothing else more. We met a couple people and immediately began working on kites and it wasn't even like okay you know you guys don't know anything uh, we'll just, you know, have you guys work on some kites, but they probably won't fly. It's, we worked on kites, and the next day we flew one of those kites, and it actually flew uh, great, at least in my kind of amateur uh, estimation. I started last year uh, working on a tapable kite. It's taken me a long time to get to a design that is consistently reliable and easy to make. I think I'm just about there with the, with the Delta. I set a maximum size for my kite. Broken down, it had to be 60 inches or smaller. I picked that size because that's the maximum size I can throw in the overhead bin of an airplane without them charging me money. Um, and I wanted to be able to travel with it. I had to sort through a lot of bamboo at a bamboo wholesaler just to get these straight pieces. You bought your bamboo? Oh yeah. I did not grow, I have grown and dried bamboo and I have determined that growing and drying bamboo is actually an expert agroforestry task that I should not undertake myself. So I'll let some professional uh, bamboo harvesters in Vietnam grow my bamboo. These only cost 80 cents. And this whole so, sampling procedure is something we're working out as a research community, we're trying to democratize equipment and take it out into the lab and use accessible materials that people can get their hands on. So this is a co-development process. It's not like Someone told us how to do it, and then this is, so this is how we're doing it. We are working it out. <laughs> For me, so, something like plots speaks to my scientific mindset and my way of going around about things, you know, how I typically do things. But it also satisfies my sense of, you know, well, you know, shouldn't I be doing something more directly beneficial to somebody else. This place is naturally a cypress swamp that because it's been cut off from the river, the lake beyond is kind of eroding away at the landscape and introducing salt water into a freshwater swamp, which is changing what kind of plants grow here. There will be a restoration project, or there is one planned, to create a little bit more of a land buffer between this area and the lake. I'm here to capture with a kite if I can, <laughs> kind of before and after pictures of the restoration for educational purposes, for communication purposes, but also just to keep tabs on what the the government is doing with restoration dollars to make sure that they're spending it on restoration and that restoration is happening. There's many reasons to be interested in this area. There's all kinds of stories, <laughs> not the least of which is the, the refineries in Norco, just south of us. 
the flooding during Isaac, the flooding during Katrina that kind of wiped out a lot of the trees and kind of created the need for a replanting program in the first place. The other thing of interest in this area is that there's a pipeline going in. And coming from the refineries, it's going to be horizontally drilled. So it only comes up every now and again before it, it'll go under the lake, but it'll go all the way to Mississippi. Part of why I'm engaged with Public Lab and learning the kite mapping is to be able to use it to monitor those sites. A lot of these sites can be very large or they might be impossible to access, so you have to view it from the air. There's this, this crazy energy that comes from the people that are there, and I think it's partly due to the open source nature of the research and the documentation of the research. And there's this giving back that is highly emphasized, and everything that I do is also owned by everyone else in the community. People that aren't even part of Public Lab also own this information. It's held by everyone, and I think that's where the ownership comes from. If someone asks about what I do on my free time, I like to talk about Public Lab, and I think when you talk about it, you get excited, and when, you, when you're excited about something, it's kind of infectious, and then you invite them to the next meetup, and you teach them about kite mapping or balloon mapping, and then the next time they're organizing something, and they're bringing their friends, and I sort of feel like it's this infectious disease, but a positive one.